Smelly is going to talk about Davrods uh, in a way that he's written. Well, he's not really talking about Davrods. Everybody else is talking about Davrods. He's talking about uh, a set of pseudo microservices that he's uh, worked out. Uh, gives power to the users. It's all right if I grab some water first. All right, hello. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to tell you something about uh, a set of microservices we made at Utrecht University to help empower our users. Uh, IRLS has a separation between uh, operations that can be executed by a normal user and operations that are reserved for system administrators, namely uh, ROTS admin type users. Uh, there's two ways you can execute those operations. Uh, for one, you can execute them manually, meaning a user sends a request, either via a web form or via an I email or telephone call. Um, the request lands at the, the IELTS admin desk, and the IELTS admin checks if it's allowed and executes the request if possible. Uh, this is not an ideal situation when you have lots of different users um, who work in their own groups, for example, groups of researchers who uh, w would like to manage their, uh, the access to their data and who, uh, who's in their group and who has what rights. Um, so we'd like to automate that, and we can. So first we need to come up with a model what, what does a, a privileged operation look like when it's automated? First of all, a user uh, hands control over to the system. It starts a supervised process. The process needs to ensure that preconditions are met, so requests need to be valid and allowed for that user. Um, and when it's allowed, the operation must be executed with elevated privileges, and that's the end of that control returns to the user. So how are we going to implement that? Well, the most logical thing seem to be microservices. We can wrap existing IELTS functions, for example, functions to create groups or to add and remove members from groups, and within the microservice, elevate privileges to Rots admin, and then return back to the user. Of course, the preconditions can be checked with policies that's, that fits in really nice in IRLs. So that's what we did. Of course, there are some security concerns because when you elevate privileges, you need to make really sure that there's no chance for uh, access to leak back to the user after the, the operation is done. And policies must also be very clearly defined so that nothing gets through unintended. So we come up with a couple of principles. First of all, security by design, meaning if you don't define a policy that can uh, grant access or allow an operation, um, it, it's just not allowed, never. It doesn't execute. So first you write a policy and then users can make use of them. Second, um, to minimize risk of programmer error, either by us in our implementation or by system administrators in their uh, policies, we minimize the amount of, uh, of work that's done with elevated privileges. So mostly they are limited to single IRLS API calls. Lastly, um, we'd like to combine privileged operations or combine them with other actions. So they need to take part in a, in a workflow. They need to be composable in that sense. For example, when, when a user is allowed to create a new group, we might want to make him automatically a member of that group so that he can yeah, actually make use of the group. So that last uh, principle requires us to extend our model a little bit. We need to trigger our next workflow step. So um, yeah, it's, it's kind of symmetrical to, uh, to the precondition. It's uh, executed after the operation has concluded. 
So in practice, it looks like this. User calls a Marco service from a rule or using iRule. Um, the precondition is executed. It's a pre-proc rule, just like many other operations have them. Um, if it succeeds, the operation is executed with what's up in privileges. And then a post-proc policy is called. It's optional, but it's there if you want it. Um, and at the end, controls return to the user. The mark service returns. Of course, the, um, the call to the mark service uh, can be a, a rule call, but you can put that behind anything like a, like a web interface, which is what we've done in our case. Uh, we've, we've created four categories for, for privileged operations. Um, we created them when we needed them. We mostly use them for group management currently. So we have a set of user management functions to create new users and to remove them. Uh, a set of uh, group management functions, creating groups, moving groups, managing membership, um, access control for any object, and lastly, metadata management. Um, that last category is needed specifically because uh, metadata on users is of limits to normal IELTS users. So we want to make use of that feature and uh, let users set that metadata in certain uh, specific situations. We have an example use case. Um, suppose we have a group named Humanities. Uh, users Ton and Chris are members of this group. Uh, they are not Rolls admin users, they are normal Rolls users. And we want to allow them to uh, manage that group. We want to allow them to add new users to it and to remove users. Um, for them to accomplish that, it's simple as this, a single line call to our group member add mark service. With those parameters, the, the group name and the user that they want to add to the group, in this case, John. Uh, and there's a third parameter which can be used to provide additional information to, uh, to the policies. But in most cases, we'll not use it and we can leave it blank. On the server side, some preparation needs to be done, of course. Um, we need to decide how we're going to check whether a user is allowed to, to perform this operation. Uh, we could do a simple check if they are this name and the group name is that. Um, we allow it, very simple. Um, we want to make it a little bit flexible, so we define that a group has a metadata field named admin, and when uh, a username is in that admin field, uh, they can manage the group. They can create new members if they like. So the preparation is setting that metadata field on the group with Ton and Chris as, uh, as values, and then we write our pre-proc policy. The pre-proc policy gets the group name, the username, uh, basically the, uh, the parameters that are, added, that are given to the microservice call, and they get, of course, the, the actor, the, the client that initiated the operation uh, in the username client. So it's a, a very simple example, but we check for the admin field in, in the humanities group and see if the username matches, and then we succeed. We allow the operation to, to happen. Normally, you probably check first if the, the group exists or not. Whoa. What's happening? Did I press the wrong button? Hmm? Thanks. And that's that. You've installed a microservice and now you can use it like this and every user that is in an admin field can perform this operation. Now we want to extend our use case. Um, we want to make sure that the user that created the group is also the user that's automatically allow to manage that group. Um, um, so first we want to uh, create a policy for allowing users to create groups. And secondly, we want them to be able to manage that group automatically. So that's a, a, a two-step process. 
there's a problem here. Um, because we minimize the amount of work that's done with elevated privileges, after the group is created, we don't know who created the group. So that's why we added specifically for adding groups and adding users uh, a parameter for initial metadata. So this can be used to set the initial administrator for the group. And if they're allowed to, to perform this operation, the metadata is also added. It's optional, of course. Um, and after the operation is, is completed, the user can manage that group. In this case, you probably want a, a post for policy that calls uh, a group member add or whatever you like to make uh, the, the client immediately a member of the group. Um, I believe I have time for a very short demonstration. So we're gonna demonstrate a little bit about um, our implementation uh, with group management. So normally I'd, I'd, I'd mount a web dev drive, but uh, since I'm not using my own laptop, I'll, I'll use the browser in this case. So this is the slash home directory of our zone. Um, we're logged in as user Luke, a normal ROTS user. Um, you can see which home directories he has access to. They, these correspond to groups and, and the Luke user in our ROTS. So in our web portal, we're going to log into the group manager as a uh, user Leia. Leia is a, is a very normal user, a normal ROTS user, not an, a ROTS admin. And Leia wants to give Luke access to the, the research Bint group. So she enters her, his name. And now Luke, over WebDAV, has immediate access to the group to which he was just added. And no IRLS administrator had to come in between to uh, service this request. It's all done with pseudomark services. So this way of uh, real-time uh, execution of uh, administrative operations, checked with policies, um, empower our users to manage their own groups, manage their own data, uh, and that's the main uh, benefit of this technology. Finally, the status. Um, we created this software with the intention of making it open source. We haven't decided on a license yet. We're going to fix that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it, we are currently using it in production on IRLS 4.1.8. We need to make some small adjustments to make it work on 4.2, mainly, I think, recompiling and linking. Um, but we plan to do it in the, in the next month. Um, it's already on GitHub. Uh, we have a package for CentOS 7, so you can try it out if you like. Um, yeah, that, that's it. We're going to make it compatible with iOS 4.2, and uh, we invite everyone to use it if they like. Are there any questions? So we've got a couple minutes for questions, and Anu can come down. Any questions about all of this? Here's one. All right, Dave. 
Uh, do you uh, command log pseudo commands so that in case something terrible happens, you know, you can do something terrible to who caused it? I mean, sorry? Do you command log pseudo commands so, you know, so that if, if I'm in there and I do a seri series of pseudo commands, are those commands logged so that you can go back and do a retrospective of what exactly happened to the system? Uh, that's your choice. In your pre-proc policy, you can create log commands and yeah, okay. operations will be logged. Okay, yeah, I would, I would yeah. do that. <laughs> By the way, I have a question myself, <laughs> if I may, um, because um, we would like to get a feeling of if this is of interest to other um, RS users as well. So if you, would you be interested to use this technology? Is it just a, just a quick show of hand of, okay, okay, sounds like we need to make it open source real quick then. <laughs> Thank I'll you. I'll work on it. <laughs> Working on that. Um, Who's next? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a really nice uh, feature, and in my humble opinion, it should be uh, part of the uh, IRL score even. Um, um, in your, you, you added this, these extra parameters to the, um, uh, for, the, for adding to the group or for making a new group. So why do you not use the policy key value pairs that you have there? Um, let me think. Well, it was specifically for for that that purpose that we added those parameters for the implementation of the microservice, and the policy key value pair is not used at all within the microservice. It's specifically reserved for use in policies. So we pass those on unmodified, which also means, by the way, that they can contain any data that the clients wants it to contain. But it can prevent extra queries. Uh, you still need to validate it, but um, yeah, that's it. I, I, I think that makes sense. It's, it's optional, so you can leave those initial uh, metadata fields blank, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>